Erev Tov Herzliya. Good morning, Cleveland, and greetings to our friends around the world who are calling in today for the America-Israel Friendship League webinar series. I'm Wayne Firestone. I'm the executive director of the AIFL in uh, the United States, and we're excited to continue this series that we started now with the Zuckerman Institute about high science issues and amazing collaborations that are going on around the world brought together by this amazing Zuckerman Institute, which has focused on postdocs, has focused on what the next generation of innovation and research will be. We had an exciting kickoff to this a couple of months ago with a segment on uh, longevity, and we're continuing the series today and really excited to bring you two world-class scientists and researchers in collaboration. I'm thrilled to have as a colleague, uh, Lena DeShilton in Tel Aviv, uh, who is the executive director of the Zuckerman Institute. Uh, she has a background in uh, uh, development and marketing. She's uh, uh, founded a company that actually allowed for international science and medical uh, communities to collaborate and come together at, at international conferences previously. She was uh, uh, worked as a director of marketing at the Ministry of Tourism for Israel. And so she really brings together these two worlds that we've seen in this period of COVID needing to find new ways to be able to communicate and collaborate. So Lena, thanks for being our partner on this. And I turn over you to introduce uh, this next segment in our series. Thank you, Wayne. Good afternoon and good evening to all of us uh, and to our friends in the US, Israel, and wherever you are connecting with us. My name is Lena DeShilton, and I'm the executive director of the Zuckerman Institute in Israel. Today, I'm honored and very happy to introduce you to our second webinar presented in cooperation with the America-Israel Friendship League. The Zuckerman Institute was established in 2015 to achieve the philanthropic vision of Mortimer Zuckerman to enhance collaborations and communications among the most promising scholars in science, technology, engineering, and math in Israel, the United States, and Canada. The Zuckerman STEM Leadership Faculty Program provides vital resources to Israeli universities, allowing them to compete with top North American institutions for the most promising candidates. The program facilitates the return of top Israeli scholars to Israeli institutions cultivates world-class scientific talented, and in return attracts outstanding postdoctoral researchers from top US universities, thus creating a cycle of excellence. Faculty scholarships are given out to every year to each of the seven participating universities, including bar Ilan University, Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, Haifa University, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Technion Israel Institute of Technology, Tel Aviv University, and the Weizmann Institute of Science. Since the start of the program in 2016, 30 Zuckerman labs have been established in Israel. We are extremely proud of that accomplishment. On today's web, we have two presenters, a Zuckerman faculty scholar from Haifa University in Israel, Dr. Shani Stern, and our Canadian collaborator and colleague, Dr. Martin Alda, from Dalhousie University in Canada. Now, I'm happy to welcome and introduce and put the mic back to wine, Wayne, Executive Director of the America-Israel Friendship in the US. Wayne, the floor Thanks. is yours. Thanks, Lena. Um, this is such an, an amazing opportunity to bring together and share in this larger global platform what a, co a scientific collaboration really looks like, which is at the very heart of the Zuckerman Institute uh, activities. Uh, Dr. Shani Stern has this fascinating background. She starts her undergraduate at Tel Aviv University as an electrical engineer and begins to work in the world-renowned startup nation high-tech industry. And then she goes on to, in her graduate works, uh, get a master's in computer science and a PhD in physics uh, from Weizmann. She continues to do research that ends up taking her to uh, San Diego with her family. 
and uh, and uh, and begins to collaborate uh, with three different psychiatrists around the world about different biological processes, ultimately that will impact on her specific field of, of study in uh, bipolar disorders. So with that, uh, as sort of a general thumbnail of her background, let me introduce one of those three psychiatrists who she's worked with, Dr. Martin Alda. He is a professor of psychiatry at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, where we have many people calling in from Winnipeg and Toronto and Ontario. So uh, uh, many Lonsmen uh, uh, that, that uh, are, are, are indeed uh, interested in, in your work that are, that are with us on the webinar today. He's originally born in the Czech Republic and, and studied psychiatry at uh, Charles University in Prague. He is a clinician scientist uh, who pioneered molecular genetic studies uh, using lithium treatment for bipolar disorders, even at a time where that was not necessarily uh, the most uh, popular uh, 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 treatment. He's received numerous international prizes uh, for uh, brain research. And really, I think this uh, uh, collaboration will give us a peek behind the curtain of what it looks like to really have scientists in different disciplines and in different parts of the world working together. So don't get frightened by any of their slides. They have promised to uh, uh, share with us uh, and answer any questions for those of us who are not uh, 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 academics and, and uh, have PhDs in the sciences. The intent of this series really is to actually share some of the groundbreaking research and make it more accessible to the general public so we can all be um, watching the science headlines on the one hand and on the other hand, really begin to um, demyth uh, demysticize uh, some of the important breakthroughs that are happening very much during this important period. So Dr. Alda, let me start with you uh, to sort of frame more broadly the, the, the fields of, of, of mood disorders that you're working with, and then we'll add that as a complement to Dr. Stern's work specifically focusing in on bipolar disorders. Okay, so thank you. Uh, greetings, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Halifax uh, in Canada. And uh, in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I would like to take you through some of the dilemmas that uh, we face uh, when we uh, both care for people with bipolar disorder and when we do research. Uh, and uh, I thought that the best uh, introduction to that might be if I, if I present a clinical case. So let's uh, call this person A, B. And uh, I need to stress that uh, all the uh, details that would uh, allow identification of the person have been heavily modified. So this is uh, an anonymized, uh, uh, anonymized uh, case history. So the AB uh, we saw uh, when she was 49 years old, uh, when we were doing a family study of, uh, of bipolar disorder. And uh, she was uh, a wife and mother of uh, four children. And uh, her history was as follows. When she was 16, she had an episode of depression that took about a few weeks. Uh, she was prescribed something uh, she didn't remember. And she took it for several months and, uh, and then forgot uh, about the whole thing. And then when, he, when she was in her 20s, she had uh, many episodes uh, usually a week or so at the time when her mood would be up, she would be very busy, didn't need to sleep. She would be up uh, in the middle of the night, baking, uh, cleaning the house, going from one thing to another. Uh, she would speak uh, very fast, uh, her thoughts would be racing, and then things would settle completely again. And then after giving uh, a birth to one of her children when she was 28. She had really severe depression that took about two months and then she recovered uh, again. And three years later, she had uh, another severe postpartum depression. And at that time, 
she saw a doctor and uh, was prescribed lithium. Within two weeks, uh, she recovered. And, uh, and then for the next over 20 years, she just continued the, the lithium at the usual dose, uh, no other treatment, and was completely well. And then several years later, after we saw her, several years uh, after the assessment for the uh, genetic study, we learned that uh, her lithium was uh, discontinued by her family physician and it was replaced with another medication because there was concern about uh, possible side effect from lithium. And then a year later, she died by suicide. Now, when you look at the, at the family history of AB, there are some clues that should alert you to, to this risk. Uh, her uncle and her aunt also died by suicide. And she had uh, two sisters with bipolar disorder. And uh, so the history reminds us that uh, the kind of old uh, aphorism by William Osler, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So how do we tackle this uh, uncertainty and probability both clinically and, uh, and research and how the two can inform each other. Well, bipolar disorder is a severe illness. Uh, it uh, is characterized by episodes of mania and depression as we saw with this uh, uh, lady AB. She often hits people at young age and then runs a lifelong course. Uh, it is familial. And it is recurrent. Without treatment, uh, the depressions and manias keep coming back. It is also a lethal illness. The mortality of bipolar disorder is uh, almost three times uh, that of the general population. But importantly, it can be treated. And uh, here I wanted to show you uh, data from uh, one of our studies uh, several years ago where we looked at the risk of suicide uh, among people with bipolar disorder. And uh, as you can see, the risk of suicide is especially high in the first five years of uh, the illness, but uh, it never goes down to zero. It continues uh, throughout uh, the lifespan. And uh, how do we do compared to other fields of uh, medicine? Uh, I borrowed this uh, slide from uh, Tom Insel and modified it and, uh, and wanted to show uh, what happened uh, uh, with some major causes of mortality uh, over the last uh, 30 to 50 years. When you look at stroke, the number of deaths uh, in, uh, in North America have decreased by at least 20,000. In case of HIV AIDS, uh, the lives saved uh, over that period of time uh, have been about 30,000. Very significant drop in mortality from heart disease. And uh, in case of uh, childhood acute uh, leukemia, uh, the number of deaths uh, dropped uh, by about 6,000 over that period of time, but it was also an 85% reduction in overall mortality. And compared to that, uh, psychiatry has not done too well. The, the deaths from suicide uh, remain about the same. And uh, the factors that probably are responsible for these medical successes uh, are early diagnosis and intervention. For instance, uh, if you have a stroke and can get to the hospital within minutes to a few hours, uh, your chances of survival are very good. Uh, knowledge of uh, disease mechanisms, uh, that was especially the case uh, with uh, the HIV and AIDS, and also personalized treatment. And that's what we are going to discuss today. Uh, in uh, leukemia, for instance, the therapeutic spectrum has not expanded too much, but, uh, but hematology is much better 
in matching uh, the right treatment to the right person. So how do we do in psychiatry with bipolar disorder? Well, it takes usually several years to get to the correct diagnosis. Uh, the illness often starts with depression and takes a while to diagnose actually that the depression is in fact bipolar disorder. And then people take uh, treatment uh, from a long list of first and second line options and you have to usually wait several months to see whether the treatment is working or not. The Canadian guidelines actually list nine first line and seven second line options. And in the meantime, uh, during these trials, uh, people can experience suicide, their disruptions in jobs, schooling, uh, family life. And what we would like to do is uh, we would like to be able to come up with uh, you know, genetic or molecular markers that would tell us uh, that this type of illness will be treated best with this type of, uh, of uh, medication. And that takes us to lithium. This is uh, from the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, where much of the uh, world's lithium uh, comes from. And uh, some of the earliest studies of uh, lithium uh, prevention of manic uh, and, by, uh, and depressive episodes come from uh, from uh, uh, more than 50 years ago. Uh, here we have uh, data from uh, a classical paper by Morgan Sko, that's the person on the right-hand side uh, of, the, of the photograph together with uh, Paul Groff and Bruno Miller Ellinghausen. Oops. And uh, as you can see, there are people uh, who would have multiple episodes of depression, like here, and then when they get treated with, uh, with lithium, the, the episodes disappear, here or here. But uh, also, there would be people, like this one, uh, who might have uh, some episodes before lithium and uh, the, the medication doesn't help at all, uh, or in this case, uh, the, same, the same story. Uh, the, the patient, in spite of the treatment, uh, continues uh, experiencing either depressive or manic episodes. And so the question is, how do we differentiate? Uh, how can we tell who is a good candidate for lithium and who is not? And uh, we have some data from, uh, uh, from uh, you know, decades of studies showing that maybe bipolar disorder responsive to lithium is a specific form of the illness. Here we have data from a 20 year follow up uh, of uh, people with bipolar disorder treated with lithium done by an international consortium uh, of which we are part. The gray bars are the numbers of people uh, followed for that length of time. And the red line would indicate the overall mor morbidity uh, over the years. So what you can see is that those people who are well in the first uh, few years of treatment usually stay well for many, many years after, up to, up to 20 years of follow-up. And we also did a positron emission tomography study in which we compared uh, uh, people who responded to lithium uh, and uh, people who responded to another uh, mood stabilizing treatment, valproate, and saw a major difference in activation of very important brain region that is involved in mood regulation, the so-called anterior cingulate area 24A. So that tells us that uh, Lithium response is uh, rather specific uh, and uh, unique to a group of people with bipolar disorder. And uh, what we also clinically saw and what we have been studying for the most uh, of the last uh, 20 plus years is that the, Ill that the treatment response also runs in families. Take a look here at, uh, you know, pedigree of uh, people with bipolar disorder where three people who were treated with lithium all did well on it uh, and another family like that and I could uh, show you dozens of, uh, of families uh, where we have uh, 
similar data. And then there would be families uh, like this one, where out of three people treated with lithium, none responded. So it seems like the, the response itself runs in families, not only the illness, but the, the response to treatment. And uh, when we analyze the data together, uh, we find that uh, in uh, people who have a close relative who has done well on lithium, you have uh, odds of uh, almost eight times uh, uh, to do uh, also well on lithium and uh, almost five times uh, better chance of responding to lithium uh, compared to somebody who, where you don't have any information, where we don't have family history details. So this is, uh, this is uh, an important uh, observation that uh, led us to analyze such molecular data in families. And uh, I think Shani will tell you more about the exciting uh, work with the, uh, with the um, molecular markers. I would just like to close, uh, uh, you know, go back to the AB case that we started with. Uh, and uh, uh, we asked ourselves the question, if you have somebody who has done well on lithium, how likely is that person to do well on other treatments? And so we used uh, machine learning uh, methods uh, where we tested uh, response uh, in uh, over 1,300, almost 1,400 patients evaluated uh, for lithium response, and uh, almost 300 people treated with uh, a different uh, class of medication, so-called anticonvulsants. And we saw that uh, if we train the model on re response to lithium, we, we could get 80% plus accuracy predicting who will do well, uh, while uh, it, that model could predict the uh, response to the anticonvulsants uh, with uh, lesser accuracy. And there are clinical features that uh, differentiated uh, the responders to lithium and the anticonvulsants. Importantly, when you think about uh, the AB case, uh, uh, lithium response has uh, no bearing uh, with, in relation to the association with suicide behavior. So the fact that the patient is at risk of suicide doesn't tell you whether lithium will be effective or not. So you might have a good chance uh, of getting good effect with lithium. With the anticonvulsants, uh, the responders typically had no suicidal behavior uh, in their histories. So you can see that uh, the, the case that I presented uh, would suggest that uh, that lady should not have gotten uh, the, the anticonvulsant medication and it might have uh, actually protected her. So I'll stop at this point and uh, hand over to Shani and uh, she will have the more exciting part uh, of the presentation. Thank you. So thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Martin, and uh, good evening to everyone from Haifa. I'm starting to go into the. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about work that I uh, did uh, a lot of it in the Salk Institute during my postdoctoral training, and I'm continuing here in the University of Haifa. And I was very lucky to collaborate with uh, Martin on this work. Uh, we got uh, really great data, and uh, we shared uh, many great data. Um, so, uh, over the few decades, last few decades, uh, many brain disorders and diseases were modeled uh, using animal models. Uh, the problem is that when we're talking about neuropsychiatric neuropsychi disorders, uh, usually the genetics is not well defined. It's very hard to get the same genetic changes in a mouse or rat model. So, in a rat or mouse model, we usually take um, you know, the genetic change that we think that there are and, and make it in the model, and then we have a good model. Uh, the advantage of animal models is that uh, the neurons that we're gonna do the experiments with have uh, developed over in a brain, in an animal brain, they received all that they needed for correct differentiation and uh, maturation. 
So thanks to the pioneering work of uh, Professor Shunya Yamanaka from uh, 2007, today we are able to take uh, adult cells such as we see here fibroblasts uh, and or PBMCs, uh, these are uh, parts of the uh, uh, blood, and we're able to cause them to reprogram them and to cause them to kind of go back in time and become uh, stem cells. So we can see here, this is the uh, schematics of the process. We infect the cells with some virus that contains a, a four transcription factors, four proteins that causes uh, the cells to overexpress them. And we can see here, this is the transformation that we made in, in my lab in Haifa. We made uh, this, they started as PBMCs and after a few weeks, they became uh, stem cells. So thanks to this method, now we have stem cells that we can derive from the patients. Now we can differentiate them as neurons. The neurons that we uh, derive eventually have the same exact same genetics as the neurons in the patient's brain. So this is a very good and precise model. Um, um, the, so all that we do not even need to figure out what the genetic changes are in the patient and a, a psychiatric uh, patients often, they don't have a specific genetic change. They have uh, very subtle, small changes that over uh, many, uh, many small changes may accumulate to some uh, disorder. So we don't have to figure it out. We have, uh, now we have uh, neurons with the same genetics. The disadvantage is that these neurons, they matured in a culture dish. So of course we try to mimic the brain environment, but we are not, uh, we don't have the exact uh, recipe. So when we, we are, today we are also able to uh, decide which type of neurons we want to differentiate the cells to. So uh, we're, we can be quite specific. Uh, when we started this uh, project, we decided to go with the hippocampus, which is an area in the brain that is known to be affected in a bipolar disorder. So these are some, just very few, but of course there are many uh, studies that have been uh, performed showing you know, different activation in the uh, bipolar disorder or parts of the hippocampus. Uh, changes to the volume of the hippocampus, uh, some changes to um, uh, parts of the uh, uh, specific uh, types of memory. So we can see here, this is the uh, uh, human hippocampus. This is the mouse hippocampus. We went specifically to differentiate uh, um, a type of cell that is in the dentate gyrus. This is a part of the hippocampus. Uh, it's called the dentate gyrus for neural neurons. And um, uh, the dentate gyrus is a special uh, area in the brain it's one of the only places that adult neurogenesis occurs. So, you know, that neurons uh, do not divide throughout their lifetime. So, but in the, so we don't have any new neurons forming throughout our lifetime, but in very uh, specific areas in the brain, um, uh, very few, uh, there does occur uh, adult neurogenesis. So new neurons, a few hundred neurons are born every day. And the dentigeris is also um, uh, responsible for helping in pattern separation. When we see images that are close by and we try to distinguish them, and has functions in learning and memory. So uh, the cohort that we received from Martin, it consisted of uh, four uh, healthy individuals that had, uh, uh, had no, did not have the disorder. And then we had six bipolar disorder patients. Uh, three of them were uh, lithium responsive. So we can see here that when they were off uh, lithium, uh, they had you know, uh, mania and depression episodes, but with lithium, they did not have it. And we had uh, lithium non-responder patients, so they continue to have episodes after the lithium treatment. And I will mark this as LR and NR for lithium responsive and non-responsive. So we started by making uh, iPSCs, induced pluripotent. Uh, you know, these are some, we have a way to uh, see what type of proteins are expressed in the culture dish. We have antibodies, so the antibodies bind to specific proteins and they have um, uh, some flow, flow force that we can image. So we can see here, uh, these are the iPSCs that uh, were, were made from the, uh, um, all, the, all the patients and the control individuals. And we can see you know, that they express uh, many of the, plur the pluripotency markers. And we also performed karyotyping, which uh, came out correctly. And next we differentiated them uh, using a protocol that was developed at the Gage Lab where I did my postdoctoral training. Uh, to make uh, the dentigeris for new neurons. So this is basically the protocol. Uh, during the protocol, we also make progenitor, neural progenitor cells. So these are still dividing cells, but they know that they're gonna be either neurons or astrocytes. And we see that the control, the LR and the NR have uh, uh, similar levels of these uh, markers for uh, neural progenitor cells. And finally, after approximately six to eight weeks, we have neurons. So we can see this is the staining of the neurons. 
Uh, and uh, we are looking for a specific protein, which is called PROX1, which marks the dentate gyrus, specific for the dentate gyrus granule neurons. So overall, if you can see the three groups, the control, LR, and NR, they all have approximately 50% of the neurons in the dish uh, are PROX1 positive, and we have a marker for them so we can do the experiments with these uh, cells. So I, uh, I, studied, I started with an experiment which is called the uh, cell patch, a uh, patch clamp, which I'll explain in, in, in two minutes about it. But generally, it allows us to see activity from the neurons. So what is this activity? These are action potentials. We can see here how they look. They look like spikes. We, sometimes we call them spikes. And these are abrupt changes to the membrane potential of the neuron. And what was interesting was that if you can look at the LR and NR recordings, uh, the bipolar neurons have more of these action potentials, so they are hyper-excitable. So this is one example, but over recordings over hundreds of neurons, we see the statistics is very clear. Uh, the, both the LR and NR groups have more action potentials, so they are hyper-excitable. So what is this uh, patch clamp? Uh, so if we're talking about a neuron, uh, so this is a, a schematic or a cartoon of a neuron. This is like a part of the neuron. We can see here the membrane. This is the inside of the neuron. This is the outside of the neuron. Inside the neuron, we have a high uh, concentration of potassium ions. And outside, we have high concentration of sodium ions. And on the membrane, we have uh, these pores that can open and close according to environmental conditions. Uh, so over when the neuron is at its resting uh, uh, state, uh, these uh, pores are more open to potassium ions. So by diffusion, potassium bypasses the membrane and uh, starts to diffuse over, but this creates a gradual electric charge to build in the inside of the neuron on the membrane uh, because these are positive ions and this causes an electrical force. So when the electrical force uh, equilibrates with the chemical force, uh, this process stops. This is the resting state of the, of the neuron. It's, it occurs when the membrane potential is approximately minus 60 millivolts so just to compare, you know, over the socket, we have 110 volts. So this is uh, about a one thousandth, a little less. So it's small, small uh, potentials. So, and uh, a whole cell patch clamp was invented in the late 70s by Erwin Nair and Bart Suckman. They received a Nobel Prize for this. And uh, it allows us to see these uh, potentials and currents, uh, on specific currents in single neurons. So what we, we do, we have a pipette with an electrode and we touch the cell uh, by applying a small suction, we fuse with, a, um, with the, the cytoplasm and we are able to record and we, then we have an amplifier and digital uh, analog to digita, digitizer, which we can go uh, record the signals in the computer and we are able to measure these potentials and currents from the cell. Uh, this is the action potential. In the action potential, we start at the resting membrane potential, potential which is minus 60 millivolts. Then uh, due to some change in the environment, usually it's because other neurons uh, fire and they are connected with our neuron, there will be a small change to the membrane potential. Uh, this causes the sodium ion channels, which are highly sensitive to the, these changes in potential to open up. Uh, then sodium uh, rushes into the cell by diffusion and this causes the membrane potential to depolarize uh, very abruptly. So now we have a mem membrane potential changing from minus 60 millivolts to approximately 20 millivolts. And at that time, the potassium channels open and sodium channels close, and then the potassium goes out of the cell, hyperpolarizing the membrane potential back. Uh, after, in the end, it reaches a steady state. Before the steady state, there was a small after hyperpolarization, it's kind of an overshoot. So we can see here an example recordings where we uh, hold the, the cell at a specific potential and then we record the currents. So a downward deflection are the sodium currents, the upward deflections are the potassium currents. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we saw that the uh, bipolar neurons were hyper excitable. But one of the things that I noticed was that despite the fact that they were both hyper excitable, actually the physiology was very different between the lithium responders and the non-responders. So we can see here in the, the example that the lithium responder has a high amplitude and a narrow uh, spike, while the non-responders have a low amplitude and a wide spike. And this prompted me to think whether I can uh, define maybe some features and use them to try to predict which of the patients would respond to lithium treatment. So for example, I, I defined the spike height, uh, which is where uh, you know, the threshold for the evoking, evoking the action potential until the maximum, that's the spike height, or the spike width, which is we measure it half uh, the amplitude. 
And so I had approximately uh, eight uh, features. And then what I did is I, 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 uh, I uh, built a computational model that takes uh, five out of the six patients, study their uh, or trains the model on their electrophysiological features, and then predicts um, the electrophysiological features of the sixth uh, patient. And we do this uh, iteratively each time we take a different patient out and we train the model by the other five. And in the end, we pull out, uh, pull together all the um, predictions to assess the performance. And we, uh, we were able to receive this way uh, a predictor that gave a very low error rate. So we're talking about a few, um, a two to 5% uh, error rate. So uh, next we wanted to see whether uh, if we take a different type of neuron, we would also see these changes. So at that time, we, um, we uh, developed a protocol for making CA3 pyramidal neurons. So CA3 is another area in the hippocampus. So just by changing concentration of um, uh, a protein that is uh, um, uh, expressed during the development, we were able to get uh, CA3 pyramidal neurons. So then I differentiated the cohort again uh, as CA3 pyramidal neurons. And as CA3 pyramidal neurons, uh, what we saw was that only the lithium responders uh, were hyperexcitable compared to the control. The non-responders were not hyperexcitable. So how does this hyperexcitability look like? So we can see here an example of a lithium responder um, neuron recording uh, versus control in NR. So the hyperexcitability occurs in the high current injection. So when we inject with a, a high amplitude current, the control and the NR neurons cannot sustain the activity, while the LR neuron can sustain the activity, keep some firing, kind of like super neurons. So we were trying to find um, a mechanism uh, for why these, uh, why is this uh, symptom that we see of the of phenotype of the hyperexcitability? So one of the things that we measured to be different was the fast potassium currents. So the fast potassium currents occur right, uh, this is the fast potassium current right here, right immediately after when we give a, a depolarization step of the potential of the memory. And we can see that the fast potassium currents were a uh, higher amplitude both in CA3 and in DG neurons for both the lithium responders and non-responders. So we can see here the, an example. We can see also that the lithium responders, for example, had a very uh, fast kinetics, which uh, pointed us to specific types of these fast potassium currents uh, channels. Another current that was highly implicated was the sodium current. So the sodium currents were very much reduced uh, both in DG and CA3 neurons in the non-responsive uh, bipolar patients. So we wanted to see how does this affect the excitability. So we plotted the correlations. So the sodium current was, uh, the excitability was correlated with the sodium currents in all the three groups, which is something that we know from the literature. This is a, a neuron which has higher sodium currents is more excitable. But what was surprising was that the excitability correlated with the fast potassium currents in the, both the LR and NR groups, uh, which is surprising because it doesn't happen in the control neurons. And so also something that we know from the literature, it's not supposed to correlate positively at least. And so uh, we thought, okay, if there's an implication of the fast potassium currents, let's try to block them. And by blocking them by three different types of uh, um, potassium channel blockers, we reduce the hyperexcitability significantly in the lithium responders. So one of the, another phenotype that we noticed was we call, we termed it a physiological instability. What we saw was that uh, the control neurons, um, they tended to be um, somewhat, the diversity between them was not very large. If we look, this is an example of uh, uh, one day reporting or one experiment. Uh, each of these graphs presents one neuron. And we can see that if we look between the neurons and if we go ahead and count the action potentials, uh, it would not be very different from cell to cell. There is, of course, differences, but it would not be so, so, so strong. But if you look at the NR neurons, for example, we can see most of the times we would have something that looks like this. Some of the cells would be very hyper-excitable, like this one, or this one, or this one. But then some cells would be very hypo-excitable, like producing almost no action potential, like this one, or this one. And this happened approximately in 70% of the times. But approximately 15% when doing um, many experiments, in approximately 15% of the time, we would have uh, what we termed a global hypo-excitable uh, state or day, where all the neurons uh, did not evoke any action potentials. And this kind of reminded us a possible uh, you know, correlation with a depression state. And approximately in 15% of the times, uh, most of the uh, cells, uh, these are different times, 
but would be hyper excitable. So, you know, I come in one day and they are almost all the cells that I record in the inner neurons are, are hyper excitable. This kind of reminded us uh, over a possible mania state. So uh, when we applied lithium, we treated the cells uh, with lithium for uh, two weeks, and then we uh, saw what happened. And indeed, the lithium reduced the hyperexcitability in the lithium responder neurons. And what another uh, uh, phenomenon that we saw was that uh, when we uh, uh, applied lithium uh, during the development, the cells grow, and the, both the LR and the NR cells, uh, the bipolar cells, grow faster and they're larger. Uh, so lithium reduced this uh, kind of overgrowth and made them more similar to the control. So also the size of the cells uh, uh, it reduced. So it actually didn't reduce it, it, it grew slower, more like the controls. So, and then we did uh, a completely different type of neuron, motor neurons, which we didn't think would be implicated. And for these, just to see the specificity, and indeed for motor neurons, we could not find any significant uh, changes in the uh, electrophysiological features. And finally, uh, this is work that uh, we started now with Martin uh, regarding biomarkers. So uh, we were interested to develop the classification uh, or the prediction uh, to something that is more usable in the clinic in the sense that it would uh, be much faster, faster and cheaper. So what we did is we uh, sequenced, uh, so we, we did performed RNA sequencing uh, just to measure the amounts of RNA in the lymphoblasts themselves. So not, right now we're not differentiating, we're just taking the lymphoblast, which is a, a small change from the lymphocytes, which can be acquired from the blood cells. And uh, uh, we saw uh, uh, many genes that are differentially expressed, and these are the most uh, strongest uh, differentially expressed genes. Uh, it was interesting to notice that the S S SCN3A, which is a sodium channel gene, uh, was differentially expressed. And just to remind you, this is the way that the uh, electrophysiological Recordings look like we see the sodium channels are very much reduced. And this is also uh, RNA sequencing that we did in the neurons themselves. So we can see several types of sodium channels that are uh, very much reduced in expression in the NR neurons. So we, we think that sodium channels may, be, uh, may have some uh, strong implication in uh, lithium response. So, and this is all the people that helped me uh, with this work. Thank you all. Well, the, no. that that particular slide is one of the ones that that um, I, I actually find the most fascinating, um, and it's one of the things that I wanted to explore a little bit with uh, Dr. Alda um, and how he connected with you uh, initially in 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 this work, Dr. Alda. I, I the slide that you showed in your presentation. Uh, comparing the mortality rates of other known disease, I thought was really interesting. And I, I guess the implication was uh, you're not satisfied with where um, uh, the, the, the current state of treatment is. And I know that's one of the things that uh, has excited you about this breakthrough in the work with um, the, the STEM uh, work in neurons. Can you, do, at, at what point did that... Um, did you realize you were going to need to find and collaborate with someone sort of uh, in, in, and take some risk and, and, and innovate in a new area that, that didn't currently uh, exist? Can you take us to that, that, that part of the, the story? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Well, you know, what I was uh, showing in my uh, presentation was that uh, a lot of treatment uh, in psychiatry is essentially trial and error. And we have been interested to take that uh, element uh, out of clinical decisions. So we started with studies looking at uh, molecular genetics uh, for which you need large samples. But the difficulty in psychiatry is that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of work that we do is very indirect. Uh, compared to other areas of medicine, we don't have direct access to, to brain tissue for obvious reasons. And uh, so when the stem cell technologies uh, appeared uh, on the scene, that that really, I felt, was a game changer. And uh, so we connected uh, uh, with uh, several other research groups and collaborated um, 
And that took us uh, to collaboration with the Salk Institute, where Shani was uh, at the time a postdoc. And, uh, and she did that great work uh, characterizing the uh, physiology of, uh, of these neurons from responders and non-responders to lithium that showed such clear-cut differences. And uh, I also wanted to stress that uh, the, the work uh, can be not only helpful in differentiating who responds to lithium, who does not, but also can serve as a platform for development of novel treatments uh, and screening treatments. There are thousands and thousands of molecules that have been already tested in different conditions. We know that they are clinically safe, but nobody thought about using them in people with bipolar disorder. And if you took that trial and error approach, it would take centuries to try all these, all these medications. Now you, have a, now you have a model of the illness essentially in a laboratory dish. So, so it offers you a significant uh, shortcut uh, to testing whether something has the potential in reducing that hyperexcitability and uh, thus treating bipolar disorder. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Stern, I, it, as I recall, you originally did a lot of your, your research with animals, with mice, and then at some point um, you, you um, have found this new path. Um, can you just describe the, uh, the time period in which, you know, all that work that you showed of your trial and error and working with um, neurons from, from uh, 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 people who would use the lithium treatment and not, can you, can you describe uh, to Dr. Aldo's point, like what, ha, ha, how, how fast did you accelerate this process um, through, through this advanced technology you're using now? Um, so you mean that like the process of how, how fast it can accelerate the, the process of finding like which of the patients would respond? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think uh, Martin knows better than me, but I think some of the patients uh, take uh, months and even years, right, to, to diagnose. And uh, this, okay, the, the method that um, uh, I did with the, with the stem cells, with the uh, neurons derived from stem cells, uh, this is also a relatively... Uh, relatively um, long. So it, you know, from, uh, from lymphoblasts to iPSC is usually approximately four to six weeks. And then to neurons is maybe 10 more weeks. Uh, but it's also a costly uh, method. And also you need a, someone to do patch clamp, which uh, needs, you know, some specific uh, technique. But uh, th that's why we're now working to find uh, something that would be much uh, faster. And we have also right now uh, some exciting preliminary results, but we're continuing this. We're hoping to find something that, you know, you, you would be able to come to the clinic and within a week uh, get a response, like, a, uh, you know, you, you have a 95% to chance to respond well to lithium or, you know, and then we can expand it, as Martin said, to other treatment. Well, I, again, one of the interesting points you made, Dr. Alda, in your slide is this idea of personalized treatment. Um, and uh, we had a question come in from one of the viewers. Do you see modern psychiatry moving toward more customized medication, similar to what we're seeing with modern cancer treatments? I, I hope so. That's, that's been certainly our uh, effort and uh, where we have invested a lot of our research and time. Uh, just, uh, you know, following also on some of the previous comments, uh, there are uh, data suggesting that uh, uh, an average person with bipolar disorder takes about 10 years from first manifestation of the illness to effective uh, stabilization. We have been looking at uh, mainly the treatment selection, but the stem cell uh, approach uh, uh, could also help in differentiating, uh, for instance, who is developing bipolar disorder. If you have somebody 
with a major depression, for instance, and you find that the cells are actually hyper excitable, as Shani was showing, uh, that might lead you to suggest the uh, possibility of, uh, of bipolar disorder. So uh, we are also looking at uh, whether the risk of suicide could be uh, uncovered through these studies. So, so it's not just the treatment selection, but uh, as a whole, it would be a package of kind of personalized, individualized uh, treatment of, uh, of bipolar disorder. Yeah, I found that fascinating that, that in, when you showed those, the, the, the family tree, that the implication for this is both on the diagnostic side in terms of being able to identify uh, people that may have the condition in their family, as well as on the treatment side in terms of seeing where you may have a, a, a better likelihood of su success with um, lith lithium. Um, maybe we, we uh, there's a question that came in uh, uh, from Diane, um, just trying to understand the, the scope of the bipolar disorder in the general population. Uh, do we have a sense of how many people actually in the general population carry the gene? And there was a question of whether in the Ashkenazic Jewish population, uh, uh, it, there is a, uh, you know, a recognizable higher percentage uh, she had seen a number of 40%. Uh, I don't know if that is, is accurate or not, if either of you would know. The, the prevalence uh, would be about uh, one and a half, two percent uh, in the general population of people who have bipolar disorder. The difficulty uh, to tell that somebody has or doesn't have bipolar gene is uh, that uh, we have access to data from tens of thousands of, uh, of people, but when you lump all different forms of bipolar disorder together, it's more difficult to tell whether actually the illness is associated with one specific gene or multiple genes. Uh, our recent uh, study of 40,000 cases uh, of bipolar disorder, kind of genetic mapping, identified over 100 uh, possible genes. The question is, do you need all these 100 genes in conjunction, in combination, or is it simply that there are some families or some people where it's one gene of, this, uh, of those 100 and uh, another uh, patient or another patient has a different gene, and that has not been resolved? Uh Dr. Stern, I want to, uh, when we spoke earlier, um, so much of your work now and so much of this uh, 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 progress is based on the, the use of the, the STEM. Um, uh, at one point that was controversial, um, but I take it that that's no longer a barrier in terms of any of the, of the work that you're doing? Yeah, so we're using the induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are not embryonic stem cells, so we don't use any fetuses. Uh, this we start with a simple, uh, usually simple blood draw, and then if you remember from my first or second slide, we make them into induced pluripotent stem cells, so we have no problems. I, of course, we go through all the ethical procedures, and we have uh, ethics uh, reviewed, and uh, it's very easy to get approved because all we take is a simple blood draw. So one of the questions that came in uh, from Moti for you, Dr. Stern, um, relates to a different um, uh, perhaps controversial new technology, CRISPR. Um, if indeed you're able to identify now the defective genes, uh, Moti is asking, why wouldn't you just cut out the faulty gene? Is that, a, is that, is that an option? Yeah. So uh, first, there's no one gene, but, uh, but there are like, for example, we just recently published also something showing that uh, left one gene is uh, is uh, so the N the non responder neuron non responder patients have uh, left one gene that is uh, very much reduced in expression. So we can target specific genes through you know experiments of such as RNA sequencing and so forth. And and definitely this is something that it will be at, at some someday and it's not very far. So I think that you know gene therapy is now starting with the uh, with those uh, with the patients that have like we have. Uh, uh, patients that uh, have very uh, strong, not bipolar disorder, but patients uh, of other symptoms that, or other uh, disorders that die very young. So this is now something that is starting. And at, you know, at some point, I'm sure it's not very far um, when, when this, the technique will be safe enough 
uh, it, it may be, you know, maybe used for, you know, such patients. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Alda, I guess one of the implications of actually knowing uh, from Dr. Stern's work whether the lithium treatment is likely to be um, uh, more more likely to be successful and, and uh, desirable to use is if you find out it's not going to be and you, you do know that you have to look for alternatives. One of um, our viewers is asking about medical cannabis. Um, uh, do you find that this is one of one of the options or is that sort of being viewed as a, a more, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a, a too wide a solution um, based on, on the, the data today? That's, that's a complicated issue, partly because, uh, of course, uh, there are lots of controversies and uh, uncertainties about cannabis. And uh, for instance, there are some suggestions that uh, cannabidiol uh, not the tetra, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, but uh, cannabidiol might be effective uh, in acute bipolar depression, but uh, that's that's just very preliminary data, and uh, uh, we are still waiting for the uh, more kind of conclusive uh, trial. At the same time, the THC tetrahydrocannabinol uh, is known. Uh, to increase the risk of psychosis. And psychosis is not uh, uncommon in people with bipolar disorder. So we generally discourage uh, people from, from using cannabis uh, uh, to kind of self-medicate. Uh, it, it can probably do more harm that, than, than benefit, but uh, with specifically with the cannabidiol, uh, that might be a different story, but uh, we will need to wait for the for the study results. Uh, and th I think there are a couple couple projects looking into it. Uh, Dr. Stern, uh, you, um, I I guess not coming from a biology or psychiatry background, you you got to choose once you understood the technology where you might apply it. Why the brain? Why did you decide that was the place to go? And I know in your slides, you mentioned the hippocampus had a specific uh, uh, desirability for this particular disorder, but um, you know, what, what, what led you to, to start your work in there? And, and you know, where, where do you think we are in terms of our understanding of, of how different treatments uh, with the brain are gonna be used with this new technology? Um. So uh, first, you know, the hippocampus, we, we are one of the, we are looking now in the, to expand the, so we did, we characterized pretty well, I think, uh, you know, the, hip, the hippocampal uh, C3 and Ventigeras uh, neurons, and we are now trying to expand to other, you know, cortical or interneur, uh, fast packing interneurons. We are looking to expand to the dopaminergic neurons, you know, uh, we want to characterize more areas. Uh, we are also building uh, computational models that uh, I, I wasn't able to show today because of the limits of time, but we're building computational models that take these changes of the electrophysiology that we measure and uh, uh, um, translate them into, uh, you know, currents and potentials in a model. And we want to see, you know, how these, uh, when we form these networks, how would they behave over time? Um, so these are all, all things that we're, uh, we're doing. Uh, regarding uh, treatment, uh, this is also something that uh, we also um, we also tried, you know, the Valparate that uh, Martin um, uh, talked about and uh, lithium we're trying in the dish. We also, our results, you know, showing that the fast potassium channels are implicated or the sodium channels. This gives, our, this gives us, uh, you know, uh, options for possible treatment that will be very targeted to towards these specific changes because there are uh, sodium channel modulators and potassium channel mo modulators. So this is something that, you know, can be developed into specific treatment for the patients. So Dr. Alda, um, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour here. So I'm, I'm just gonna give you one last uh, opportunity to think about that mortality slide that you showed earlier. If we were uh, super successful with uh, Dr. Stern's uh, 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 approach, um, 10 years out, what would those mortality lines look like? What, what 10 or 20 years out, what's the possibility and what's the time frame in which we might begin to see 
uh, you know, the impact of this kind of uh, treatment and approach? Well, given my age, uh, I think I need to be optimistic. So <laughs> I, I, I would hope that within 10 years, we could see some, some uh, significant uh, drop. Uh, I think uh, in psychiatry, things go hand in hand. Uh, I think the research, uh, for instance, uh, also informs uh, the non-medication part of uh, our clinical care. And uh, I've been showing some of the stem cell work to the patients who, who feel that it's very helpful in destigmatizing the illness uh, for themselves and their families. So, you know, uh, there are lots of kind of myths and uh, stigma around uh, bipolar disorder. So even at this stage, it already is helping and you can take it uh, into psychoeducation sessions with patients. But... Uh, uh, I, w I would hope that uh, within 10 years we could, uh, we could cut the risk of suicide and bipolar disorder by half uh, and uh, it would be very substantial because, uh, because suicide is uh, actually a major uh, leading cause of death, especially in young people. You know, when you compare it with, uh, with other conditions with high mortality, suicide is uh, really tragic because uh, it affects teenagers, people in their uh, early 20s. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so saving those lives uh, will be very much worthwhile. Well, th thanks so much for quantifying that and, and giving us really a, a, a vision of what this collaboration uh, looks like in the, in the real world and why it's important. I know uh, you were sharing before with, with Lena, your intention to come visit Israel on, uh, as part of a, a, a sabbatical so that you could actually spend some time directly with Dr. Stern advancing this uh, uh, work that, that you all have been involved in. We're grateful um, uh, to you both for this kind of collaboration and to the Zuckerman Institute, which is making this a priority between great institutions in the United States and North America and in Israel and other institutions around the world. We're grateful to all the scientists and, and engineers who are involved in this endeavor and really um, uh, doing something that makes us all proud. That is working on behalf of all humanity. Every time a scientist gets something right, the whole world benefits. And we are so grateful for this uh, uh, focus in this area and for your explaining to us what the significant is. Thanks for joining us today on the webinar. We want to invite everyone uh, here today and your friends, please come join us every Wednesday and Sunday. We're here with our webinar series. This Sunday, we're going to be celebrating another milestone in Israel's history. Just this past month at the Knesset was a commemoration for the 30 year anniversary of Operation Solomon and the Aliyah or immigration of the uh, uh, Ethiopian community uh, 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 to Israel. Uh, we have an amazing panel of, 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 of a number of people who were involved in those missions, both people who were living in Africa at the time and others who came from Israel and were part of this dramatic rescue. So please come join us on Sunday. Join us each week. Everyone, thanks for your time today. Everyone have a safe, safe week. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you for the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.